Maseret Yevamot, Daf Samehe, we hope to complete the sixth pedic with this Daf. And we're going to start off with a few cases about claims of infertility. As we saw, the law is that after 10 years of marriage, uh, the um, husband must divorce his wife um, and try to uh, try to fulfill Peduervu with another woman. Uh, however, the woman is entitled to a ketuvah because, after all, it may very well be his problem that he is infertile. Uh, if he could prove that she is the one with the problem, uh, so-called fault, even though it's nobody's fault, nobody is, uh, uh, um, uh, get, is, uh, becomes infertile on purpose. But nevertheless, in terms of legal question, who is at fault, is it, who is responsible, who is the cause of the infertility, if it's proven that she is the problem, then she would not get paid the kituvah because he says, well, I only married you on condition uh, that we would have children. And so therefore, uh, the kituvah would not, he would not have to pay the kituvah. But if it's his fault, then he does pay the kituvah. If it's uncertain, he also does pay. So we're going to see now a few um, variations and interesting cases. Tenora banan. Ni said la rishon ve lo hayu la banim la sheni ve lo hayu la banim shelishi lo tinase el alemi sheyesh lo banim. If someone was married and waited 10 years and she did not have children, so she married a second guy and they again did not have children, so she should not marry a third guy like we saw. That's the opinion of the B, Yudanasi, that two strikes and you're out. However, there is an exception. She may marry someone who already has children. So he already fulfilled his mitzvah of having children. And now they are going to marry for companionship, which is a positive value in and of itself. Right? We saw that above a person should not stay, should not remain single. And so being married and having intimate relations is a value in and of itself, besides for having children, as long as one already fulfilled the mitzvah of having children. So that's okay. She can marry the third time for that. Aniset lemisha ye en lo banim te seve lo ketuba. However, if she goes ahead and marries someone who does not have children, then he must divorce her and she is not entitled to a ketuba because in that case she was already married two times, 10 years uh, each, and did not have children. So this marriage was not authorized. And uh, she, uh, by that time, has a chazaka and a, a presumption that she is barren. So for the third time, she does not deserve the ketuvah payment. Now a question about a related case. If in the case where a woman was married to husband A, didn't have children 10 years, but husband B, didn't have children for 10 years, and then she got married to a third man, whether or not she was allowed to, but she did anyway. And again, she does not have children. By this time, by the third period of uh, 10 years, that proves that she is the one that is infertile. So how about can the first two husbands come back to her and say, hey, listen, look, now it's proven that you were the one that had the problem, not us. And we sh did not need to pay you the ketuvah, right? We only paid you because it was uncertain. Maybe we're the problem. And now after your third marriage, and infertility shows that you are at fault, and therefore we want the money back. On the one hand, can they say to her, now it's revealed that you are the cause? and we want our money back. Or maybe she can say to them, No, no, I was fertile at the time I was married to you, husband number one, husband number two, and now I got older, so only now I am infertile with this third guy. Right? So it could just hap it be, happen to be. You were the one, husband, that was uh, the cause of the infertility. I, if I had what, was married to someone else, would have been uh, would have had could have had children early on, and so um, uh, this onset of infertility happened later. It's possible that she can make that claim. And the answer is yes. Her claim is reasonable. Could very well be. It is in fact true that uh, the older woman get the more difficult it is for women to get pregnant. And so yes, that makes sense. It could have been, very well been his his problem. Uh, eh, 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 and with the at first, and um, if she became infertile later, so sorry, husband number one and number two, you cannot reclaim your kituba payment.
Ibaya lehu, niset la revii, vahula banim, mahu ditit bae la shilishi. So we have a new question. If a woman was married uh, three times already and didn't have children with any of her first three husbands, the first two husbands paid the kituva as they were supposed to, because who knows if maybe it was their problem. And then the third one did not pay a kituva as we just saw. That was the last halacha. The third one says, oh, you know, by this time it's proven that the woman is the one that's infertile he does not pay her kids he's not pay the kituba but let she goes ahead she goes let's say she goes ahead and marries a fourth husband and again whether she was uh, permitted to or not uh, she did anyway and all of a sudden now she does have a child so now she wants to go back to the third hu third husband can she go back to the third husband and say hey you didn't pay me a kituba because because you were the third one and it's already presumed that I was the one that's in, uh, that was infertile. But look, now I'm married to a fourth husband and I have children. So now I have proven that I am not infertile. You were the problem. So, and you never paid me the kituba. So now I want you to pay me now. Can she make that claim? And the answer is, uh, So the, the, the sages tell her, uh, listen, better to be quiet. Silence is better than speech in this case because you're opening up a can of worms. The Masi Amar La, Ana Da Adata Da Hachi, Lo Gerashtich, the third husband, could make the uh, counterclaim and say, I did not give, I did not divorce you on uh, this condition that you were in fact fertile. I only, I only divorced you because I thought you were infertile. Now that I know that you can have children, you know what? I never would have divorced you. And therefore, retroactively, he can try to claim that this, that divorce was invalid. You are still married to the third husband, and therefore any kid she has with the fourth husband uh, would be mamzerim because she is eshet ish. And so by claim, making this claim to the third guy, he oh, she opens herself up to him making an even more dangerous claim that will really harm her. So better that we advise her better to forego on this ketuvah payment and don't get yourself into further trouble. Okay, so now on that we have a challenge. Matkif ladaf papa iihi shatka anan mishatkinan. The papa says, okay, even if she doesn't make this claim uh, to try to collect money from the from the third husband, nevertheless, maybe do or should we be quiet on her behalf? In other words, the court themselves they have a responsibility to do justice, and even if a litigant or a person does not make a claim, the judges could, should come and say, hey, listen, uh, you, you have a right to such and such a thing, or you have to pay such and such an amount. And so we should make the claim on her behalf and uh, say, yeah, the third husband would have had to pay, even though um, this may result in him. And if that's the case, then, well, that's the case. You know, if he comes and says, um, I, I gave that get under false pretenses, and that's undone, well then we, you know, if that's the truth, then we have to pursue the truth. We can't just make believe that it didn't happen. Uh, no, rather, we don't make that claim, and the guy cannot make that claim either. Rather, we say, she, uh, it could be that she was, in fact, infertile for those 30 years, and now something happened, and she got better, she became healthy, and now she became fertile. So the guy cannot prove otherwise, and therefore he can't say, oh, I, I, oh you were actually fertile that time, and I, I wouldn't have given you a get. Right? He gave a get. Um, uh, under the presumption she was infertile, she may very well have been infertile when he gave the get. And so, forget that claim. Okay, who amar mina? Vi amra mine. Another uh, case. Um, if a guy comes and says, mina, she is at fault. She's the one that's infertile. I'm not paying the kituva. This is a regular case that for one husband after 10 years. And he says, I'm not paying. I know it's her. Then she says, mine. No, she says he's the one infertile and he has to pay up. So what do we do? Rabbi Ameh says, whenever it comes to a dispute between a man and a woman, we believe her. Regarding case things about fertility, she knows better. She knows what's going on um, better than the guy. Uh, pregnant con conception will only happen if the man's if the man shoots like an arrow his seed and only then it will result in conception so she knows she she's aware she can feel 
and she will know whether or not he shoots like an arrow. He doesn't know whether he shoots like an arrow, and therefore she is believed to say that he is the one who is not uh, infertile, and he has to pay, and that is in fact the case. He has to pay. Ahmad Ihu, another case. If he says, He says, listen, I, you're telling me I have to pay a kitubah, or again, a regular case, 10 years, he has to pay the kitubah. He says, wait, before I pay, I want to go and test myself out. I'm going to go and marry another woman, and let's see if she can, uh, if, we, if I can have a child with her, that shows that I am fertile, and you are the one that's infertile, and then I will, I'm not going to pay my kituvah. And if I cannot have children with this other wife, then, then I'll pay the kituvah, because then it'll show that I'm infertile. Can he go and do this uh, test? Rabbi Ame says, no, you cannot do that. You still have to, uh, you still have to divorce her, and you have to give a kitubah, and then you can go and marry. Because Rabbi Ame says, anyone who marries a second wife upon his uh, first wife has to divorce her and give a kitubah. Um, when you get married, that's part of the deal um, that you guarantee that she will be the only wife. And if you go take another wife, then you owe her a divorce, and you have to pay the kitubah, which is language that is still included in our Ketubot today. By the way, tangent, in, uh, in the Ketubot that we, uh, we use in our community, uh, it also has a clause for 10 years that uh, after 10 years, he has a right to divorce her so that he can have children with another. Um, even though, thankfully, uh, this really does not come up uh, with modern uh, fertility treatments that are able to uh, solve the vast, vast majority of cases, thankfully. Okay, um, so he, uh, so Rabbi Ames says, sorry, you cannot do this test. Rava, however, disagrees and says, yes, that's fine, he can do this test if he wants. A man is allowed to marry as many women as he wants besides his first wife, as long as he can afford it. If he can support them all, that's the guarantee that the husband has to his wife. It says in the Ketuvah, he's going to feed, clothing, shelter, he has to be with her. As long as he can fulfill his responsibilities, if he's rich enough, then he can go ahead and marry another. And then if he, then he can prove whether he's fertile or not. Okay, another case. If he says, um, you, uh, it, 10 years go by and they don't have children. And so now the court says, okay, you got to go get divorced and you have to divorce her and give her a ketubah. <clears throat> he doesn't want to pay the ketubah. So he comes and says, oh, no, she had a miscarriage in the middle. Remember, we said that if there's a miscarriage in the middle, it restarts the clock and you count 10 years, not from the time of marriage, but from the time of the miscarriage. So he says, she miscarried in the middle, and we start counting the clock again. Ten years is not up. I don't have to give a divorce. I don't have to pay. And she says, I never miscarried. Ten years is up, and you pay. Um, not that she necessarily wants to get divorced. Maybe she does. Maybe she wants out. But the point is that that's it. It's over. She wants She wants to get paid the kituvah. He wants to deny payment. So what do we do? She is believed that she did not have a miscarriage. Because if indeed it's true that she did have a miscarriage, she, we presume, would admit it. Because a person does not want to give themselves a label as being barren. Uh, because that means she didn't have a miscarriage. That means she went already 10 years without a child. And um, that's, a, that's a difficult thing to, to face and uh, to, um, to, to, uh, uh, to have upon oneself. And therefore, if she had a miscarriage, <clears throat> she would want to say that she had a miscarriage. Look, I can get pregnant, right? And I'm not, I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not infer infertile. Uh, so therefore, if she says that she didn't have a miscarriage, we believe her, and he has to divorce her, and he has to pay. Okay. He pila. If a vechazra pila, vechazra pila, a woman has a one miscarriage, and then a second, and then a third, now she has a different chazaka, not a chazaka of infertility, that would be 10 years, but a chazaka that she cannot bear a child to completion. And therefore, this is another criteria. He has to give her, um, he has to uh, divorce her, and, um, and so he can try to have children with another woman, because uh, it's proven she's, 
uh, a presumption, presumption that she will not be able to give birth to a child. Now, case based on this law, who amad apilatere fi amiratelat? He says you miscarried twice, only twice, and therefore. You still have another chance. I don't have to divorce you, and I don't have to pay your ketuvah. Again, all this is about the money. Remember, the ketuvah in those days was a big sum. Not like today, we do a kind of more, a, a more of a symbolic number. It's not the main financial instrument that we use today as a prenup. But back then, this would be you know a couple of years of uh, living uh, expenses. And uh, so she, um, as she says, I you only miscarried twice. I don't have to divorce you. And she says, no, it's been three times, and you have to divorce, and you have to pay the ketuvah now. Rabbi Yitzchak says there was actually such a case that came to the Bet Midrash. And they said she is believed. All these cases, she's always believed. Because if it were true that she did not miscarry three times, she would not claim to miscarry uh, three miscarry three times. If she was not was not true that she miscarried three times, she would not have said that because a person does not want to establish herself as someone who miscarries. This is a, a label that no one would choose to have put upon themselves. Uh, it's a it's a it's a negative thing, and therefore, uh, if she says she miscarried three times, we believe her because no one would say that as a lie about themselves. Uh, even if it meant that she could collect it to collect the ketuva, um, that um, diagnosis is not something that one wants to uh, wants to take upon themselves willingly. And uh, that is the end of that mishnah. Very very interesting cases. Um, that um, must have actually come up in reality, as we see here in this last one, some of them, uh, where the, when the Kituvah sum was significant. Okay, and now the last Mishnah of the Pedic, which is the um, essential source for Peru Urvu. Haish misuve al ava lo haisha. Only the husband has a commandment uh, to, um, uh, to multiply and have boy and a girl, or whatever definition, as we saw before, but the woman herself. Uh, ironically, even though she's the one that's actually um, uh, uh, giving birth to the children, she is not the one commanded. She just helps out her husband as a necessary partner. Interesting mitzvah that one cannot do by himself. Disagrees. He says, look at the Pasuk. The Pasuk Hashem speaks to both uh, Adam and his wife and tells them together that they should be fruitful and multiply. And therefore, both, according to Biochanan ben Baraka, both have the mitzvah. Okay, good. What is the source? For the Tanakama, that only the man is obligated. Uh, the rest of that pasuk says, and fill the earth and conquer it. Um, part of multiplying is also dominating over the earth. Human being is the highest of all species and uh, con controls our, things in nature by our uh, creative ability, and we conquer the earth. Well, conquering has to do with warfare. Men go to war, and women is not their uh, uh, um, way to go to war. And so um, multiplying, having children, is associated with conquering, and therefore that is the way of men to conquer. This is a very interesting dadasha, and obviously uh, requires um, a lot of thought to figure out exactly what it means. Here's just one uh, suggestion that comes to mind, uh, is that even uh, nowadays, it's the man that asks the woman out on a date, and he's the one that proposes. Uh, we still today put the responsibility on the man to go and find a suitable mate and, um, and uh, make the marriage happen. And so therefore, since he's the one that is the active party, and the woman is more passive, so therefore, the responsibility would be upon him to go and uh, make, get a proper marriage and there, thereby fulfill um, so maybe that's behind it, or maybe something else. Um, but in any case, we actually reject this dirasha. Wait, the pasuk actually, as Hashem is talking to both Adam and uh, Chava there, uh, Ish and Isha, and he tells both of them, you, both of you, go and conquer 
uh, the rest of the species, the rest of the land. It's humans, men and women, that are doing the conquering. So what do you mean, only him? Nachman says, no, no, I can explain it. Because um, although we pronounce it, it's actually written in Torah without a vav. And so the the um, the way it's written, the ketiv is vichibsha, and you singular. It's not plural. It's a singular, meaning only the man uh, goes and conquers it. So he revives this tadasha. But we have an alternative. Rav Yosef Amar Mehacha. I have another pasuk that I can learn it from. Ani el shaday pere urve lo kamar peru urvum. When Hashem speaks to Yaakov, he says, "I am your God. Go, um, be fruitful and multiply." He says it in the singular only to Yaakov. And so therefore, here is an example of the mitzvah, only to the man and, and not to the woman. Um, and does not say it in plural in that case. All right. Now that we quoted one statement in the name of Rabbi Ila, he's the one that said um, this Vichib Shuha, uh, we quote another couple of statements from the same Rabbi Ila, uh, who said that just as it's a commandment for a person to rebuke someone else, if you see, if you have uh, some constructive criticism, some advice for someone else, then the mitzvah, it's a mitzvah to tell him something that he will uh, obey and heed. Uh, he'll be he'll be open to hearing it. Uh, so too, it is also mitzvah for a person not to say something that will not be heard, right? If you have some constructive criticism, but you know the other person is not going to be receptive to hearing it, <clears throat> is only going to get angry about it, then it's a mitzvah not to say it, right? It's not going to help anyway. It's just going to make things worse. Rabbi Abba Omar, Chova Omer, Chova Shneemar, Pe'al Tuchach Lech Pen Yisna'eka, Hochach Lechacham V'yehabeka. Rabbi Abba doubles down on this and say, so not only is it a, is a mitzvah to keep quiet if the person is not going to listen, it's actually you're obligated to keep quiet um, if you know the other person will resent you for uh, for rebuking them, as the pasuk says in Mishle, do not reprove a scorner, lest he hates you. Uh, he will come to hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Right. So a wise man loves to hear constructive criticism uh, as a uh, an opportunity for improvement. But uh, a scorner, you're just going to make him hate uh, you more and uh, increase tension and distance. So no point in doing that. It's prohibited. said another statement in the name of his teachers. One is permitted to change from the truth, uh, to tell a white lie, uh, and for the sake of peace. All the way at the very end of Sefer Bereshit, after Yaakov Avinu dies, uh, the brothers come to Yosef and say, Oh, listen, Dad told us before he died to tell you that you should forgive us for uh, selling you uh, to uh, into slavery. Now, nowhere in the text beforehand does it say that Yaakov ever told the brother told the brothers to tell Yosef. It wouldn't make sense because if uh, Yaakov wanted to say that, he could have told it directly to Yosef. Listen, forgive your brothers. But, uh, so the brothers seem to have made this up. The brothers were afraid that Yosef was holding a grudge the whole time, was just waiting for Yaakov to die, and only then, after Yaakov was gone, then he would go and take revenge against them. And so, they, for the sake of peace, uh, came up with this, um, <clears throat> this uh, change of truth, and they said, yeah, Dad told us that you should forgive us. Um, okay. Uh, in fact, Yosef had forgiven them, and it was not a problem. They were probably just projecting their own guilt uh, back upon Yosef. Uh, but he said, no, don't worry. Right? This all worked out for the best. Okay, Rabbi Natan Omer, mitzvah. As not only is it permitted, not only mutar, it is a commandment to change for the sake of peace. Shene'emar, v'yom shemuel ech elech v'shama sha'ul v'haragat. Hashem commanded uh, the Navi Shemuel to go and anoint David HaMelech. And Shemuel was afraid to go. This is because uh, King Shaul, he's still the king now, he'll hear about it and he will kill me if, uh, if I go and do this. And Hashem said, listen, I have an idea how you could get around it. Take some sheep with you. And then when someone asks you on the way, where are you going? You say, oh, I'm going to offer a sacrifice of some sheep. So Hashem is actually the one that 
uh, commanded, recommended that Shemuel uh, make this white lie. It's not a total lie because he could have taken the sheep also, but that was not actually the purpose of his journey. And so we see that Hashem himself commands and to mitzvah to divert from the uh, absolute truth uh, for the sake of peace. And another proof, Great is peace that even Hashem himself changed um, someone's words from exactly exact quotation in order to preserve peace. Originally, when Hashem told Sarai, Sarah, that she was going to have a child, she says, what? How can we have a child? Right? After all, my husband is so old. So she said, which is true, I mean, they were both old, but she said, my husband is so old. Then Hashem came to Abraham and said, do you know what your wife just said? When Hashem repeated her words, to Abraham, he repeated it as if she said, I am old. Because if Hashem would have reported to Abraham that Sarah said, Abraham is old, he would have come, oh, you think I'm old? You're old. This is a nice way to conclude this sugya because it reminds, it reminds us of the, uh, the, the questions we had earlier where uh, husband and wife were not sure who was the one that was responsible uh, for uh, not being able to have children. And so this is uh, reminiscent of that. And even though this is only here by association of the name of the sage, it does thematically connect to what came before. Okay, so you see, even Hashem, for the sake of preserving peace, so Abraham would not say, oh, she said that about me, that I'm old, and then they would cause a fight. Hashem um, misquoted change the quote in order to preserve peace. So certainly this is a tremendous value, although one can um, uh, should not take this too far and uh, you know start lying about all kinds of things to preserve, preserve peace, right? I didn't tell him that I stole money from him because I wanted to preserve peace. No, it doesn't apply, it does not apply across the board, um, only in these carefully selected types of cases. Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka Omer. Okay, back to the Mishnah that said, according to Yochanan ben Beroka, both the man and the woman both have a mitzvah of Peru Urvu. Itamar Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi. Chadamar alacha ke Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. Chadamar en alacha ke Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. These two early Amoraim in Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi. We know one of them said that Lacha is like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka, that both men and women have a mitzvah, Peru and one of them said that Lacha is not like Rabbi Yochanan ben Ben Beroka. Uh, we don't know which one is which, Who's, which Amorah said which. Tistayem de Rabbi Yochanan hu damar en halacha, de yatev Rabbi Abhu ve kamar mishmed Rabbi Yochanan halacha, ve adrinu Rabbi Amev Rabbi Aseh le'apayhu. So you know, it makes sense that Rabbi Yochanan is the one that said we do not follow Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. Why? Why do we? Why? Why would you say that? Because there was a story one time of Rabbi Abhu, a later Amora, who was sitting and he was saying in the name of Rabbi Yochanan, "Oh, halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka." And there was two other sages there, Rabbi Ame and Rabbi Ame Ase, and they turned their faces in disagreement. They didn't say out loud explicitly, "You're wrong." But they showed by their by their bodily expression that they did not agree, and so you see from that story, since they disagreed, that must mean that they were right. And um, in fact, uh, the, uh, in fact, Rabbi Yochanan is said halacha is not like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka, um, not like what Rabbi Abahu said. Um, okay, so that's all one version of that story, a slightly different version of the story, uh, with different people. And other version, other version says that it was not Rabbi Abu that said um, halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan, but rather it was Rabbi Chiyabar Abba that said halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka, and uh, and they and Rabbi Ame and Rabbi Ase turned their faces and said no 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 Rabbi Yochanan would not have said halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. Okay, now, so we have two different versions. Okay, either way makes the same point. Amara Papa Bishlam al Rabbi Abu Amara. And Papa says, I think the first version makes more sense, that Rabbi Abu is the one that that gave that report, and the other two sages turned their faces. Mishum kevod, the bekesad, la amru lev, la midi. And it makes sense because Rabbi Abu was close to the emperor. 
and therefore they had great respect for him or were afraid of him, and that's why that explains why they did not contradict him outright and say, no, uh, Rabbi Yochanan never said that. Uh, so they only turned their faces to only suggest it because um, they uh, because he was close to the emperor. But according to the second version, there's a bichia bar abba that quoted in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. The halacha is like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. Don't uh, get confused between the, the various Rabbi Yochanans. Rabbi Yochanan is the second uh, generation Amora. Uh, who's saying that halacha is like Rabbi the Tana, Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka in our Mishnah that says Pirurvu uh, is applicable to both men and women. Um, okay, so, but if it's Rabbi Chia Baraba, he was not close to the emperor, and so then the other two sages would have said outright, no, that's an incorrect, uh, uh, that's an incorrect quote. They would have said it outright. Okay, but either way, uh, it shows that uh, probably Rabbi Yochanan uh, said En halacha kerebi Yochanan ben Beroka. Okay, mai have Allah. So anyway, what's the conclusion? What is the halacha? Tashema d'amar rabbi Acha bar Hanina amar rabbi Abu amar rabbi Ase. O bada hava kamed rabbi Yochanan bichnishta de kesare. Ve amar Yosi viten ketuba. Ve'isal kadatech lo mepakeda ketuba mai abidte. So here's the proof. We have a story uh, that a, a, a certain woman came before Rabbi Yochanan uh, in the Bet Knesset in Caesarea. And she said, "I this is uh, after 10 years of not having children, she is the one that demanded, demanded a divorce. Uh, and so this is unusual. It's not clear why he was not obligated. Maybe he had children uh, already from a previous marriage. So she, he was okay. He didn't have to give a divorce. But she did not have children. Uh, with him, and she did not, she not, she did not have children with anybody, and she comes and says, I demand a divorce, and I want a kituvah payment, it's his fault, and I want to go and have children with someone else, and Rabbi Yochanan said, yes, you have, you're entitled to get a divorce, and get kituvah payment, so that you can go and marry someone else, and have children, now, if you think that a woman is not uh, obligated in Peru Urvu, then why why should she be able to demand to get divorced and get a ketubah settlement? He, he's not the one that was per, that was pursuing it. She was right. So it must be that she has a has her own mitzvah of of Peru Urvu, and that's why she can say, "I want out. I deserve a divorce. I deserve ketubah because you wasted my time and you're infertile, and I'm going to go and have a child with someone else." So halacha is in fact like Rabbi Yochanan ben Beroka. We try to prove from this case, but we say no. Dilma te'ana. No, maybe not. Maybe she had a different claim. Um, she wanted children for another reason besides peru urvu. Well, why else would she want to have a child? I mean, there could be lots of reasons. But here's one example. Kiahida ame amra le. A certain woman once came to the ame similar circumstance, and she said, "Havli kituba, give me my kituba." I want out of this marriage because you're not providing me children. I want children. Amar la zil la me me pakadit. Rabbi Ameh said, "No, get out of here. You do not deserve your kituba. You do not. You 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 um. Uh, if you want out of the marriage, you know that's one thing. But you're not getting your kituba because you are not obligated in in pedurvu. So you can stay in the marriage and not have children." Amar le mesibu dila mateve ala dehadach. And she said, Dehadach Itita, she said, in her old age, referring to herself, in my old age, what will be the, with this woman? Uh, if I don't have children, who's going to take care of me when I grow old? Right? The children would um, would uh, provide for, take care of physically and uh, and, uh, uh, um, uh, and uh, economically would take care of their, their, their parents. And uh, um, so she says, I need a child. Uh, as uh, as my retirement plan. Oh, that's why you're right. You does you you need a child. What's going to happen? Maybe you know. Even if she has stepchildren, her husband has children. They're not going to help their stepmother. That's not going to help her. She needs her child. So he says that's a good claim. Yeah. Uh, sorry, guy. You have to give her kitub. You have to divorce her. Give her kituba. She has a right to try to get children, but not because of pedu misvah pedu She has a different legitimate right. Okay, so that, therefore that case is not a proof. Another another case where a woman wanted to have a child for her old age. A similar case, a woman asked for a divorce because he wasn't having children and uh, and for kituvah. 
as she, so she could start a new life. And uh, again, here, Rav Nachman said, sorry, you are not obligated in Peru Vu, so you, it's okay for you to remain childless. Says, does not this woman require a staff to hold on to and a hoe for burial? Who am I going to lean on when I'm old? Who's going to bury me when I die? I need a child. Amar Kihavadai Kafenan. Rav Nachman said, oh, you're right. That is a good uh, a, 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 a solid request, and therefore, yes, you deserve to have the ability to have a child, and he, the husband has to pay the ketubah. Yehuda and Chizkiya Teomim Hayu, another a story about Yehuda and Chizkiya. They were twins. Uh, they were sons of Rabbi Chiyah. But these twins were born at different times. One was finished baking after nine months, and the other was finished uh, being formed after seven months. And so one uh, was delivered after seven months, and one after nine months. Uh, modern medical practice would never allow such a thing to happen. Um, but it does seem that it is possible in ancient times that uh, that twins might be delivered uh, with uh, a significant delay between them. Uh, all right. Um, I mean, probably not seven months, but this has to do with the whole seven-month pregnancy thing that we've discussed earlier. Uh, but in any case, the point is she had a very, very difficult double pregnancy, and she didn't want to have to experience that again. Yehudit, that was her name of the mother. Debitu de Rabbi he was the she was the wife of Rabbi Chiyya, who had these uh, twins uh, two months apart. Havala sar leda, she had terrible uh, birth pains. Sena e mana ve kame de Rabbi Chiyya, so she did something about it. Uh, she changed her clothes, she disguised herself, and she came before Rabbi Chiyya as a woman asking a halachic, uh, a halachic question. Amra iteta mi pakeda and she asked. So she asked her own husband, but you know she was she dressed very modestly, and uh, and and uh, on the different clothing than she usually wears. He didn't recognize her, and he says she asked him this question: Is a woman obligated in having children? Amar la la. And she, he said, no, not obligated. Right, that's the halacha we saw. Tanakama. Azla ishtiya samad akarta. As soon as she heard that, she went and she drank an infertility potion to ensure that she would never get pregnant again and never have to uh, suffer such pain uh, ever again. The sof iglai milta. After some time, uh, it was revealed what happened. The Bichia found out that she was the one that asked the question and she took this potion. Amar la. He felt bad about it. He says, if only you could uh, deliver one more womb full of children for me, another another set of twins, uh, that would have been wonderful. Like, oh well. Uh, um, in fact, he did have four children. They were the twin boys. And they were also twin sisters. And they were all were all uh, very important uh, uh, people who were, had great accomplishments, and so he did uh, fulfill Peru and Vu, at least according to all opinions. Um, but he uh, he wished. <laughs> I guess that's why she disguised herself, right? He would have said like, oh, "Why why are you asking? Right? Uh, don't you want to have more kids?" But she did not want to. Vela mi pakad mi pakdai. And then the last final question, is it in, in fact true that women are not commanded? I mean, that's what he answered. If, is that true? There was a story about a woman who was half slave and half free. How could that be? Well, she was a slave and she was owned by two partners. And one of the partners set her free. The other partner did not set her free. So she's half, half slave, half free. And the court comes and came, and they forced the uh, partner who still owned her as a slave to set her free. Right? It's not fair to keep a person half free, half slave and half free. Amar of Nachman by Yitzchak. Oh, so here the point is that why did they force him to uh, set her free? Is it not so that she could fulfill Peru Urvu, her free self had to fulfill Peru Urvu, but her half slave self is not allowed to get married. She was not so she was not able to get married to any anyone to a Jew anyone to fulfill pedurvu. So they forced him to free her so she could fulfill pedurvu. Isn't this a proof that women are obligated? 
uh, to have children. No, that's not the reason they forced her. But rather, because she was in this uh, terrible predicament and she could not get married, people were taking advantage of her and treating her in a loose manner. And so that was not, not a good situation. And so they forced um, the uh, owner to free her so that she would be fully free and then she could go get married and uh, she would not have to worry about being mistreated. Um, halacha, according to Dambam, is in fact that women are not obligated in Peru Urvu. And uh, this completes this uh, really fascinating uh, discussion. Hadran Allah, Haba Al Yevim Baruch Adonai Amen Ve Amen.